Could you imagine having 20 years of subscription box experience all wrapped up into your brain? Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm here today with the OGs of the subscription box space. I'm joined by Mark Odekoven, president and COO of Annie's Publishing, and Tony Pitlack, president and COO of SFG. They are going to share some amazing tips for your subscription box business all around. Let's go. Let's dive into this because I've got about five different bullet points here I want to talk through. And again, I really run the gamut of some, some great, amazing uh, advice and, and guidance. And so anybody who's running a subscription box business, whether you're just getting started, there's some tips you'll learn along the way here or growing and scaling. And even, you know, as you kind of continue to grow, some amazing things really need to be looking at. One of the things that I hear most often, and so this is a, the place I want to start, is about outsourcing. And when you should be outsourcing some of your fulfillment and, you know, a lot of the, you know, the, the, there's, there's so many moving pieces to that. And, and Mark, you guys have a lot of experience in growing Annie's. You have a lot of different, you know, kits in there and, you know, maybe a great starting point. First and foremost, Mark, share a little bit about Annie's and, and what you guys do. Cause I think that would really benefit our audience knowing your background. Sure. So Annie's, uh, to your point, has a whole bunch of subscription boxes, and uh, those kind of run the gamut of two different types of, of boxes. One of them is a, a book of the month or fiction book of the month uh, um, um, club, and we have about 17 of those titles. And then we have a whole bunch of craft kit clubs, and uh, um, those go across a whole host of different types of programs, right? Everywhere from kids programs to adults to boxes that continue on for a long, long time to boxes that you end at a certain time frame by making a project. So we have, a, a, you know, about 25, 26 of those. And then those can come in actually different uh, um, waves themselves. So imagine different colors or different uh, um, types of fabrics, right? I mean, so... So we have a whole host of different clubs and, you know, we, we obviously are deep into this box uh, business and, and, you know, hopefully people can see that we understand what's going on out there. And you guys have been around for quite some time. Annie's Publishing has, correct? Publishing has been around for almost a hundred years, wow. but uh, the subscription box business, they um, first started in about 2001. So over 20 years of being in the subscription box business. Yeah. And the subscription box world, that is quite some time, you know, since almost since you, you guys probably helped invent the subscription box. Business. <laughs> you might think so. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So you've got a wealth of experience here and, um, in, t in terms of that fulfillment, there's a lot of moving pieces there, right? So there's a lot of benefits and related hassles. Tell me a little bit more about, about that and how you guys help decide the path that you take with that fulfillment yeah. strategy. So from a fulfillment strategy, one of the positives of, uh, from my perspective, uh, would be having that outsourced partner um, really helps us as we are growing, right? I mean, um, I could envision that an in-house place that had you know, a couple hundred million dollars worth of business, they might want to bring it in house to where they could do all types of customization. But you know what, for a growing company that keeps adding a lot of um, clubs to it, you know, th there's a lot of benefit for being with a outsourced partner. Um, think about from a talent perspective alone and trying to bring people up to speed on what you're trying to get accomplished, right? I mean, think about from that hiring process. Um, you know, being having, having an outsourced partner really enables us to hit the ground running fast. Mm -hmm. um, it also allows us to leverage what others are actually doing in the marketplace as opposed to trying to figure out just what are we going to do ourselves, yeah. right? So having that, you know, group concept um, and a platform to allow that to come to life and that shared expertise really, really is beneficial. Yeah. And it's, and it's not something then you have to incorporate into your planning process necessarily and worry about by having a good partner that you can rely on and trust on, you know, that you can go to them and say, Hey, we're, this is coming a heads up. And then they do the planning side of that. Uh, that's correct. And, and yeah. you know, they get to think about what are the technological places that we need to be to and get out in front of them as opposed to us spending hours and hours and hours consumed around, well, what is that next best thing? Right. How, how are we going to get things to our customers that much faster, that much uh, less expensive? 
Yeah. So, Tony, you're the guy that gets thrown that big ball of challenges then. <laughs> <laughs> when we look at it, yes. Yeah, but they're in a good way, right? We love challenges, and they, they keep That's us right. on our toes and, and help us constantly innovate. For the benefit of our audience, Tony, give us a little bit of background on SFG, if, if you will, and then we'll dive into this, your side of it. Sure. SFG is a service provider that uh, offers fulfillment operations and technology solutions. We focus primarily on the subscription-oriented industries, uh, everything from publications to subscription box to membership. We also have several uh, clients that have non-subscription businesses, right? So uh, e-commerce websites, for example, catalogs, uh, and then, of course, subscription box, which I, I mentioned, but that's kind of taking on its own life. Annie's is a, is a client and also a sister company of ours, and they have all three of those models and, and more. So our best client profile and part of what I'll talk a little bit about later today is when you are able to take your brand and use it in different ways of selling, right? Right whether you do one shots, subscription models, memberships, if you can uh, grow that way, we've seen a lot of strength in the uh, diversification of business models. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about, and let's, let's step back into the fulfillment side of things for a second here, because that's a, obviously there's a lot of, a lot of different moving pieces to that. Tell us about the, the time where you see, um, businesses making that decision of doing that in-house versus outsource. What, What's that inflection sure. point usually? So uh, I've been at SFG for about 16 years now. My prior lives were on the client side for about 15 years. Uh, so I've worked and understood the vendor challenges from both sides. And it's, it's exciting to see the decision points that clients make as to when to do certain things. Uh, to Mark's point, uh, what, what we typically see a company, especially one who's starting a new uh, initiative, a new subscription box or a new program. Uh, they like to try to start it in-house sometimes, uh, mm -hmm. but then as they scale, they prefer to spend more of their time on their core competencies, right? So Annie's is, is excellent at marketing and product development, for example. And so at some point, you don't want to have to focus on all the details like Mark was mentioning, right? So with scale, as you begin to grow, there's a lot more details to manage. And it's a specialty that fulfillment companies are used to, to doing. There's a lot of pieces to the puzzle. Uh, by working with a provider like SFG or someone who specializes in fulfillment and operations, uh, they know how to open certain doors and help get you some cost savings and all, also bring to the table unique solutions that you may not uh, be focused on. Yeah. So, you know, we're seeing a lot of change in this space along the lines of personalization and customization. Is that what you're talking about when you talk about like unique solutions and, you know, around those types of sides? And I'm sure, you know, opening the doors, I'm curious about that as well. Can you expand on those a little sure. bit? Sure. Each, each fulfillment uh, company brings to the table different options for their for their clients, right? So SFG not only does the operational solutions, but they also have technology solutions. So if you can find a partner that brings it all together and then interfaces it with your your website and your own uh, marketing cycles, then then you found a really good partner there. Yeah. So you you brought up personalization. So as an example, SFG manages the customer database for about 95 percent or more of our of our clients hmm. and we have apis for example that go back and forth all the time to websites uh, so all of the data that we collect from customer service which we also perform uh, from web interactions uh, all of that information can be used by the clients to increase their marketing know their customer better etc et got it in, in addition, I want to bring up the fact that fulfillment companies like us have a lot of different networks that are already developed. So companies that try to do the shipping uh, piece on their own, they probably are doing a fine job, 
But companies like us bring a lot to the table as far as optimizing networks and delivery. And uh, oftentimes with the volume across clients, we can actually offer a lower price uh, to than you might be able to get yourself, for example, yeah. with volume discounts. And that, that's what I, I hear a lot is the biggest advantage from a, a cost saving standpoint of those volume discounts really start to add up. Um, right. in addition to a lot of the, you know, the time that you put into it as well and the overhead associated with it. So it sounds like there's, there's a, t- a lot of advantages in there. Really? There are. And Paul, if I could bring one more up, uh, some companies like SFG offer, uh, many services to many clients, right. And bring that volume to those services. So for example, not only shipping, but also think of all the companies that, we work with or a fulfillment provider works with, they need boxes, they need envelopes, they need paper, they need a whole bunch of different things. So uh, procurement in volume discounts uh, really helps also. So if you're working with a provider and you're doing your own sourcing, talk to your provider and see if they can bring their volumes to the table and provide a, uh, a better price overall for you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, I'm sure that's not a lot, you know, something that a lot of these companies don't think about, right? Because that's a whole nother layer of added cost savings and, and benefit and, and layer of management too that exists within there. So that's right. absolutely. So sounds like there's a, a you know, definitely a lot of advantages to that. Um, I want to step in for a second though, a, a little bit ago, I don't know if you caught it, Mark, but Tony called you out. Uh, in a good way, right? He called you out as, as masters of marketing and, and doing what you well. And I would I would tend to believe it based on the number of kits and subscription boxes you guys have. So I'm curious to, to suck a little bit of your knowledge out of your brain here to share with our audience as much as you can without giving all the secret sauce away, right? Um, <laughs> share, what are some of the things that you're seeing, some of the, the, the patterns you're seeing out there right now in acquisition and some of the tools you guys are using to be so successful if you if you can. Yeah, so just don't suck too hard on that straw, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> we won't steal all of your trade secrets, that's don't right, worry. Right. But well, I think some of the things that we're really seeing are some um, some changes in um, where we're finding customers, right? Uh, um, obviously, as I started, uh, or stated um, to start with, and he's been doing this for 20 years, right? And back in the day, it was all about direct mail, direct mail, direct mail, right? And so um, we would send out... Uh, hundreds of thousands of direct mail pieces. We would wait patiently um, for them to come in, right? Um, And then we would send the kits to people and we would then pray that they would pay for those kits, right? To get started, right? And then each month we would pray that they would send back another check, right? (laughs) And in today's world, right? Everybody is uh, um, getting online for the most part, right? And um, yeah. Yet we're finding that uh, um, that those pockets are are not quite as easy as they were in the past. Uh, um, you know, when companies got going on the Facebooks and the Googles uh, of the world, you know, it seemed like that there was a lot more um, you know demand out there than 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 there might have been supply for, right? And what we're finding is really the need to getting a lot more analytical in um, you know, who we're gonna go attack and where we're gonna go find those customers at. And so we spend a lot of time you know, inside the data um, building lookalike models and trying to figure out what are those elements that uh, you know, are gonna drive the customers our direction. And then we have to spend a lot of time testing all types of different creative to try to figure out what's gonna work best. And, uh, um, you know, we, we at any time might have six, seven, eight campaigns out there of testable uh, marketing pieces to try to figure out what's going to work for different customers. So having that data is, is a crucial part and mining that data is, is uber critical in trying to find success. Yeah. And so, Tony, you talk about having that data at your disposal as SFG. How does that you know, kind of lend an advantage to the partnership that you have as as a fulfillment center and, and helping them with all the moving pieces of their business. Sure. We've got clients that have many different levels of um, uh, analytics. Some do it completely in house. Some have third parties and others uh, rely on uh, tool sets that we provide or others provide. Right. So for example, 
SFG, if you're a client of SFG, we've got your operational database, and then we layer on top of it a business intelligence tool that allows you to access that information, do custom reporting, pull information, et cetera. We also feed third parties. So for example, Annie's uses a, a tool that, uh, also to do some data mining. So we feed that, we feed third party databases. So we're all about data and information, not just operations, because the more you know about your customer, uh, that's why we collect thousands of data elements, by the way, for our clients, and then feed them to places so that you can make sense out of them. And if you build a model, uh, you can feed it back to us and we'll apply it and, and use it for various things like uh, list selections, email selections, uh, customer loyalty programs, however you want to use that data. And so those, those data points then are allowing you to be more uh, efficient and smarter marketers. Are you seeing you know, that bring that to the table to help with the acquisition side of the business? Yeah. So the better we can understand not just who the customer is, but our cost of actually being able to fulfill on that customer. And to kind of go back to what we started talking about is being able to optimize what that cost is. Right now we can start to understand what the lifetime value of that customer is. So we can set different acquisition strategies to say, I'm going to acquire people at a break even of three months, six months, nine months, whatever that timeline is. Right. And, and now, because I not only have the data, I also have the um, ability to go back and say, I am efficient in what I've got to get for that. Um, now I can have a better marketing um, set of communication pieces and a set of targets that you know, make sense from a business perspective. So are you looking at it? Are you able to take then some of that data and segment it down to, let's say, you know, you know, people in the Northwest region are, are more profitable than, you know, the South, you know, based on fulfillment strategies or based on marketing techniques, tech, tactics and techniques. Is that, so I'm just trying to understand kind of some of the yeah. pieces in there. Yeah. And take it further. It's by a different product, right? I mean, yeah. um, we have some products that have a much better retainability than other products, right? And so we're able to then say, hey, I can spend more on this um, versus that uh, right. because of that. We might also have the ability to say, I got programs that are more of a donor base, right? So this is uh, um, parents or grandparents buying for, you know, kids or grandkids, right? And I can understand that perspective versus somebody who's buying it for themselves, uh, you know, and, and now I can really bring all that to life to say, here's, here's how I can segment that target audience. Got it. So you, you, you said a key word in there that I want to jump into now and talking about retention and, and talking about you know, retaining the longevity maybe of people within a certain um, either line of business or a certain subscription box that you have. What are you seeing right now? You know, because I think in the, the world that, that we live in, we don't talk about retention as much. I've heard a lot more in the past year or so, but it really is something to for brands to lean into that they, they don't as much. How are you guys looking at proactive retention and retention as a whole? Yeah, so um, really, we're, we're leveraging the data to first off, try to predict when people are going to start falling off, right? I mean, and then from that, we're starting to better understand what are the drivers of that to become much more proactive. So, um, and, and we're trying to leverage every single listening point that we actually have to try to get to, are we having a pain point here or a pain point there, um, so that we can step back from that and look at the full customer experience and say, where do I need to enhance it, right? Um, and, you know, we've done certain things from a proactive retention standpoint is taking clubs that normally would have been um, shipped every four to five weeks. So we started to see some um, opportunities for customers to get it to them faster. Um, that was outside of what you would have thought from a normal subscription standpoint, but we had people who were wanting to finish projects much um, sooner than the typical, hey, uh, four to five weeks. So we were able to create a new set of products that got it to people two weeks instead of four weeks, right? Listening to what they wanted. And we've seen retention go up significantly from that point um, because they're able to get this product faster. Um, they're able to learn the techniques that much um, sooner. And thus, this leads them to a longer um, lifetime value for us. 
Oh, that's interesting. So using that data set, you know, to obviously make better decisions and it definitely drives, I could see how that drives retention for sure. You know, so Tony, from your side, from what you guys are seeing and as SFG and the tools that you have, what are some things that, that you're finding beneficial right now? So we've seen our clients try a whole bunch of different strategies and the, the best, best recommendation that I have is to always test it. Don't just assume it's going to work, right? I mean, that's just a standard tenet for marketing, but always test it. So some of the uh, things that we've seen, strategies and tactics include uh, something as simple as an email newsletter that has bonus content that might go along with the box or the contents of the box, right? Or expand on the um, history or context of the items within. Uh, some partners are also offering new ways to pay for the subscription project uh, product. For example, a popular one is to migrate from some annual or quarterly uh, payment plans or models to more of a monthly, let's call it membership model and literally calling it a membership, right? That's a very popular one that's working for a vast majority of those who are trying it. And sometimes you can even charge the consumer more on a monthly basis than one twelfth of the annual cost that you would have normally charged for uh, an annual subscription, for example. So you're actually net net making more money. You're taking a risk, of course, with retention over time. But if you get that down, you're making more money over time. Uh, and then the last tip I have here that I've seen some clients do is to make the customer feel as if they're a member of an exclusive group, maybe by packaging several things together uh, in, in a membership, like repurposed content, uh, something that might be low cost for you with high perceived value, uh, digital freebies, uh, and the like. So these are, you know, great ways to keep your customers engaged and, and keep them coming back around. And it sounds like too, they can really like lengthen the the timeline that you're keeping those customers on and, and ov overall improve your bottom line in there. Agreed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would build off what Tony said is that being able to add those value adds are extremely important, right? And, and it is about having touch points beyond the package, right? I mean, being able to give reason for someone to remain engaged with you as a company in between getting shipment to shipment to shipment. And that's the, those are critical pieces. And, and Mark, you know, one of the things that I'm curious about from your side, even sometimes the way you talk about stuff. So like you have creative girls club, right? And it's not just, you know, the creative girls box or creative girls subscription box. It's a club. It, it does. Do you find a lot of that like language is meant to keep people feel included and as part of something bigger there? Yeah, that's absolutely to Tony's point, whether it's memberships or clubs, right? We, we really try to build that inclusiveness, you know, and for some of our clubs, we're also trying to um, take it beyond just the club, right? I mean, the exact example that you're talking about, Creative Girls, we're trying to get the, um, you know, young girls to be empowered by understanding that they can be unique themselves and the creativity that they can bring to the table right, um, should instill confidence into them into the future. And that's really the core of how we communicate that club. We talk about kickstarting her confidence, right, um, or kickstarting her creativity that goes beyond just the simple project she's doing, which has a broader um, um, appeal. And that's really what we fundamentally believe in, is how do we get her to have confidence in a place and a time frame where for girls, that's often an awkward time frame, right? And yet to build that creative spirit and that creative nature should give her a lot more confidence to take on a lot of other things. And you're competing with a lot of other interests that exist in some of the fits in the palm of their hand today. <laughs> Correct. You know, I've, got, exactly. I've got twin girls that in eight days are turning 12. They just got their first cell phones. And the other day I knock on my daughter's door and I said, what are you doing in there, Allie? Thinking immediately she's on her cell phone. She's actually doing a little art project. I was like, right. wow, this right. is, this is cool. But so can you, know, so I bet parents really embrace that as well of, you know, finding other ways for keep their kids engaged. And, and you guys are really in that, that sweet space of what people are looking for right now too. That's right. We spend a lot of time also talking about getting kids off devices. Yeah. Um, but we also talk about um, from a parent perspective, having me time, right? I mean, <laughs> Gosh, um, yes. you know, 
whether that's going <laughs> away to sip a glass of wine while you crochet or you build some type of home decor projects, it really yeah. is trying to create that inner peace and that uh, instill that it's not driven by a device in your hand, right? And yeah. uh, um, you really can just go enjoy yourself. I was looking for that time to sip wine and crochet on Sunday. Uh, and I found it when, when Allie was doing the art project. That's it. You described my wife perfectly. I wish I could crochet and sip wine, but I, I ended with 20 other house projects, that, the latter part of what you described there. So yeah. exactly. anyway, whatever, whatever it may be, that, that time is important. So let's, let's kind of take a step back for a second on what you're talking about there and what you're building helps create some loyalty. And uh, one of our most popular talks at SubSummit this past year was Jay Myers talking about you know, the, the subscription death curve and, and the way loyalists that are to your product can really help you continue to propel your brand going forward. And it sounds like you guys have built a lot of great brand loyalty and passion within the members of your clubs and your communities. How are you really leveraging that to help propel your growth and continue that going forward, Mark? Yeah, you, you know, uh, it, it, interesting enough, I'll just use a, a, a stat that blew my mind, uh, you know, until I really dove deep into it and better understood it. And that was 20% of our members today have been with us for um, over 36 months. Okay. That's over three years, right? And and we actually have 15% of our customers who have been with us for almost 60 months. And so it was like, that was kind of an explosion of the mind. And, and, you know, I remember not that long ago, we would take advocacy and we would use advocacy to have people write ratings and reviews, right? And, and really that's not where the state of advocacy and that uh, um, those best customers are today. Today, we're using them as influencers, right? And having them, you know, take our product and showcase it, whether it's on Facebook or TikTok or YouTube or wherever they're, they're wanting to do it. And, and using that advocacy as influencers, right? And that influence marketing has just really, really taken off. And, and a lot of these people, they want to just do it because they love the product, right? And, and they want others to hear about it. And, and that is just awesome news. And so we are gaining the benefit of, of those customer advocacies um, where we have watched our, our um, search engine optimization, the SEO ranking, just go up because of the number of individuals that are propelling our product. And so we see a lot of our business now, you know, come in from an unpaid source because people are going out there and typing in creativewomen.club.com or uh, creativegirlsclub.com or any of these others that we have out there. And that's great news. I mean, that's, that really makes uh, the brand building that much more impactful. Yeah, I, absolutely. I couldn't only imagine it's, it's the best source of free marketing out there. As well, <laughs> absolutely. Which we're all looking for as many free channels as we can get to those <laughs> rising with rising ad costs and everything else, all our other costs rising out there. Um, That's so right. I can imagine. Tony, I'm curious to get your perspective on what you're seeing out there across the clients you work with and, and the industry as a whole. So one of the more successful uh, strategies and tactics, uh, both in this case, that our clients use is uh, the most successful ones are monitoring their customers across channels. So this goes right in line with what Mark was saying. It's, it's online, right? If you have a community building tool in social media, that's great. Uh, but it's also being in touch with your consumers wherever they might be. So let's say you have a customer service call center, uh, which SFG provides, and you wanna get in touch with what your, what your customers are saying. Well, monitor the phone calls or listen to call recordings, right? Understand what the customers are saying. Uh, watch your Facebook posts. Uh, what'll end up happening is every once in a while, you're gonna see something you can't get distracted with. It's, it's a sample of one. But when you start seeing a trend, right, of a certain, uh, maybe a certain product that you shipped in the last shipment is just going crazy. Everyone loves it. Well, that might give you a clue for even another new box, a new product, right? Or maybe a sub niche in one of, uh, 
in one of the clubs, right? You can maybe launch a new product or you know that that's a winner uh, because it's driving traffic to your website. Uh, and likewise, you might get feedback that something you just sent is kind of not the greatest and you're going to avoid those next time, right? Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we have seen it to, to Tony's point is, uh, um, you know, the, both the advocacy, both in positive and negative, right? I mean, when, when we do something wrong, we hear about it from the customers, but one of the most positive things that you see out there is that a lot of customers actually go to the defense of Annie's before we even have to say a word about it. Right. And, and that's, that's an awesome place to be. For them to say, hey, settle down, Annie's is going to take care of you, right? Um, um, or, or to say, you know, I'm sorry you had a bad experience, but trust me, this is not the typical thing um, from this company. Um, that's when you know you have a great customer base. And um, um, that's a very positive place. You know, I, th- I think you're being humble here, Mark. It's a true testament to building a good company as well, because... You know, if they know, if your customer base knows you're going to take care of it, right. whether, you know, you've got a great partner like SFG that will, and if something's wrong, they'll get it shipped out the door right away because that speaks volumes to yep. customer care reps that answer questions immediately. You know, your, your audience is coming to bat for you because they know you guys always do what's right. That, that's correct. That's correct. And so we look for every way we can to make that customer experience as positive as possible. And because you know you're gonna you're gonna know you're gonna have errors and you're gonna have mistakes, right? I mean that just that's business. Um, but it's how you react to it. Yeah, and it, you're you're exactly right. It's it's about how you take care of it. And to take a step back for a second, where you're talking about Tony in terms of listening to the customers and, and you led into from Mark was that is, is so incredibly valuable that I don't think enough brands really take advantage of of, of listening, just sometimes even picking up the phone and making a phone call and saying like, Hey, you know, I see you've been a customer for 48 months now. Curious what keeps you around, you know, and, 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 and learning that type of knowledge and information, or when somebody cancels listening to those phone calls, uh, that your call center is handling and, and understanding, yeah, we just, um, we're, we're moving. And so it's hard for us like, Oh, wow. You know, could we have done better there and getting an updated address or whatever it may be. And not saying that that's something the call center is doing. I'm sure they're already asking for an updated address, but you know, just understanding true the customer's needs within there um, really can go a long way in in a brand success. And probably not a lot of a lot of us are doing out there right now, and could be doing better. So interesting, you should bring that up. On Friday, Tony and I were talking, and I was telling him, "Hey, we got to hear more about what uh, anybody's having an issue with, right?" Because uh, they, they have to be out there talking about it, right. you know, go prep those or, or go um, tell those reps. We, we got to hear more. Right. Uh, um, so it is important to be out in front of that yeah. and to right. do everything you can, you know, to a point to, to make that customer as satisfied as possible. Right. Cause it may be something little that, you know, let's say in the woodworkers club, you know, we're going to cancel the kit just didn't quite work out. And so if the call stops there versus saying like, well, tell me what about the kit? didn't work out well, the nails were a little bit too small and uh, right. it was hard to hit with the hammer or whatever it may be that then translates back to your product development team and, and things that you can, you know, you can make better that you may not have found out before. Correct. Yeah. So Agreed. always, I always love asking questions to get to answers. Um, you know, and, and so just kind of, I want to, you know, I know we've, we spent a lot of time and there's some great tips in here. Um, I've got some final thoughts for everybody before, you know, Mark and Tony, is there anything, that we didn't touch on that you want to make sure we, we share with our audience today? I have one more tip, if you don't mind. Uh, one of the, as we all know, it costs more to acquire a customer than to retain a customer, right? So one of the tips that I would really encourage everyone that's in a recurring billing model uh, to do is to make sure that you've got a payment processing process that is buttoned up and it's not a discount processor. Uh, I've seen too many people that want to save a couple pennies over here by having a discount payment processor on the front end, uh, and then your rejections go up, and then your retention, uh, you you can't get that next charge for whatever reason. So make sure that you've got a good, solid payment processor. You've got account updater that's working to constantly keep the credit card chargeable every month or whatever your period is. And then also a good solid decline recovery strategy that 
is uh, both strategically thought through and automatically occurs in the systems that you're using. That So it's really funny. In the very beginning, Mark was describing the send out the kits, hope the checks come in, hope they requ- you know, send another kit and hope. And so it, that kind of uh, responsibility or that concern shifts in different ways to now like, are we going to, is your credit card going to process again this month is, you know, the decline rate, are we going after that? So a little bit different uh, beast, but with the right partner in there, much easier to control than just kind of hoping the U.S. mail doesn't screw it up. Agreed. <laughs> right. So you guys, we touched on so many amazing things here today. Just a, a quick recap of some my notes here. Obviously, when you look at a fulfillment strategy, there's some tremendous cost savings, not just from, you know, cost benefit of, of shared, you know, shipping costs and different elements of that. Uh, looking, you know, you talked a little bit about, you know, Tony, about the procurement side of things and some big things we're seeing there. Uh, Mark, you talked about leveraging data to help make critical decisions and, and listening to customers to help drive your business forward. Um, and both of you really shared some great strategies along the lines of looking at the way you position it, whether it be a, a membership or a club, dr- bring people in and keeping them along from an email newsletter and keeping them engaged. And, and Mark, I was super impressed with your data of the longevity of those customers of 20% of them sticking around for those 36 months or more. Uh, and, and you guys are just such a tremendous wealth of knowledge. I know if any of our community takes at least just one of these tips away, it'll be game changing for their business. So you've made a huge impact here today and I truly appreciate it. And, and thank you for being here. So, so Mark, again, thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. And, and Tony to you as well. Thanks Paul. Appreciate yeah. it. Been a pleasure. Yeah, Thanks for the opportunity. Pleasure. So real quick too, and just to, to, to wrap it up here, Mark, if uh, our audience is looking for any of your kids, I want to learn more about Annie's, where should we point them to? What's the best place for them to check you out? Best place to go is Annie's kitclubs.com right that's awesome. annie's don't forget the s kitclubs.com a n n i e s kitclubs.com and right. there's they can find them all there and find some amazing resources to keep their children entertained so we can do more cro- crocheting and wine drinking and then <laughs> that's uh, right tony how about for you with sfg if they want to engage with your team and learn more sure our website is sfgnetwork.com Awesome. So uh, Sam, Frank, Gary, sfgnetwork.com. Easy, easy to find. Perfect. Well, again, thank you so much for being here today and uh, look forward to catching with you more soon. See you at Sub Summit 23, I'm sure. Yes, Excellent. Definitely. Awesome. Great. Thanks, guys. Awesome.